little bit about me because we do have to justify our expertise. Everyone does it. Uh, I'm an accessibility consultant and a games producer. So I live in a spreadsheet most of the time. And when I'm not in a spreadsheet or some sort of project tracking software, uh, I do this for a living. Um, I've worked with AAA, AA, indie studios, solo devs, national charities in the UK like Scope. I've worked mostly with UK companies. Uh, things like these kinds of talks, um, things like how to set up an accessibility team, how do we implement accessibility into our design, you know, our development process, how can we improve accessibility and, and things like that. Uh, and yeah, I am a real life disabled person. Woohoo! Um, I'm very proud of it because what else are you supposed to do? <laughs> um so about you i know I, you weren't prepared for this uh you're pretty awesome and the reason is because you're here and you are ready to listen to information about accessibility that makes you pretty awesome um and that means you're already on the right path to making games more accessible if you're interested in it already that's a step forward um because taking these steps to learn more and be more active in accessibility it makes a huge difference to the industry and to the future of games and game development. So about me too. So there's a second part to about me. Um, Adam Jensen said it the best. I never asked for this, but here we are. Um, here is a selection of the uh, fun ingredients to the cocktail that is Harriet. Uh, there are more than this, but these are the ones that cause the most challenges in a present mode. Um, it means that I tick many boxes when it comes to accessibility because uh, things affect me in lots of different ways. For example, because of my sensory issue, uh, challenges, I am hard of hearing in situations where there are lots of sounds happening. I can't discern one thing from another. So in crowds, busy places, if there's things like traffic, I can't hear anything. Um, I have a lot of cognitive interesting uh, elements, let's say, um, such as uh, social cognition with the autism, ADHD. Uh, it means that if I wasn't medicated and under a lot of caffeine today, we'd be having a very non-linear chat today. Uh, and I also have fibromyalgia, uh, which is a chronic pain condition that means my body thinks I'm post-exercise pain 24 7 uh, and the level of which depends on how good of a day it is uh also have a seizure disorder if i get stressed my body nopes out um it's kind of a bit like a blue screen of death uh and i just my brain restarts um and i get a lot of cognitive challenges from them afterwards but yeah this isn't by no means exhaustive and the reason i'm showing it like this is to show that one disabled person one person with disabilities is one person with disabilities just because they have one doesn't mean they don't have more many disabled people have what they call comorbid conditions um and they can affect them all in different ways and while i do have these diagnoses i am by no means speaking for everybody who has those diagnoses everybody with autism adhd all of these conditions each person with those diagnoses experiences life very differently to the next person with those diagnoses uh, and yeah, uh, one in seven or 15% of the world is estimated to be living with at least one disability. Um, that's as of two weeks ago, that number was correct at 1.1 billion people. That's uh, a lot of people, nearly 1.2 billion people estimated to be living with a disability, at least one. Um, that's a lot of people. Um, People might think that you don't need to do accessibility. You don't need to think about that, but you are one out of seven people. So if you're in this, in this, in this talk right now, there are more than seven people, which means that other than me, there are multiple people in the, in here who have at least one disability. And in the UK alone, there are 14.6 million people at minimum with disabilities, which is actually one in five. Um, so yeah, think about where you are right now in the Discord sort of setting. That means that there are multiple people here who have at least one disability. 
and a bit of the financial side because that is at the core video games get sold that is how they make money uh but funnily enough the total spending power of families in the uk that have at least one person with disabilities within that family unit um it's estimated at 274 billion pounds a year that is a lot of money uh they call it the purple pound disabled people do spend money it's Oh, they, there's research to show that they spend more on DLC, they spend more because games allow entertainment and often a alternate uh, life, you know, being able to do things you cannot do in real life. So, what what is games accessibility? What is it? Um, it's definition, and this is changing as we find out new things. Um, it's the process of removing or mitigating the barriers in place that have a fundamental negative impact on a player's gaming experience. And you'll notice that that doesn't mention disabilities at all. And there's a good reason for this. Um, it's because accessibility really is about inclusive or universal design. And that is to design something that is as functional as possible for as many people as possible. Um, Accessibility, while primarily it does affect people with disabilities, it's not necessarily just those people that benefit. So we'll talk about the impact that every single design decision we make has the potential to include or exclude the player. Um, I don't know if this video is going to behave itself, but we'll find out. So that event was a couple of years ago now. Uh, lots of fun. That was uh, was good with the we did something called co-production where they involve disabled people in any campaign they do that involves disabled people, which is all of them because they're a disability charity. Um, don't know why my slide order came up weird then, but never mind. Um, so. Stats in that two thirds of disabled people uh, experience barriers. That's a lot when you think of, let's say, out of those 14.6 million people in the UK, um, two thirds of those people cannot play games or oh, experience a barrier in games. So, why is that? Um, we have the social model of disability, which is what most things. Uh, follow uh, the alternative is the medical model so the medical model says that it is because of your disability that you can't access things which is is wrong it's not correct it's not because of the disabilities i happen to be born with that the world is a challenge to access what the social model says is that it is the world the the, the culture the setup we have that creates disability Badly designed buildings, for example, stairs only, uh, no lifts, tiny aisles in supermarkets that don't allow anything wider than a fold up pushchair to get through. There you go, stairs only. If there's only stairs to get to somewhere, disabled people who require the use of either crutches, sticks, wheelchairs, other, uh, maybe they've got limited range of mobility, can't get anywhere. Um, special schools, um, so schools that isolate and uh, separate uh, children, uh, students with disabilities, um, those affect people. Um, people I know that went to the special schools really struggle to get by in society afterwards because their only experience of the world was a very curated environment that didn't include the option of them succeeding in life. Uh, discrimination, bias and stigma are an unfortunate thing, but those things do affect how uh, disabled people are able to access the world. Uh, lack of support and reasonable adjustments. Uh, so the law in the UK states that um, if you have disabilities, your employer 
Uh, in fact, any public facing company or uh, things like that have a legal requirement to offer reasonable adjustments that will enable you to access their service. And that includes employment, that scores, everything like that. Um, so when those things are not in place, it creates disability. Inaccessible transport, so buses that don't let push, uh, wheelchairs or people with crutches on because there's already a push chair on it. Uh, no disabled parking, so if there's no disabled parking spaces, people won't go to places because they'll have to walk a long distance and they may not be able to. Uh, social isolation, because of the often discrimination, bias, stigma and things like that, um, disabled people often find themselves in isolation from others uh, because they can't access the same activities, so they tend to withdraw and low job prospects for disabled people. Um, I think it's actually autism that has the uh, lowest rate of employment out of uh, uh, many disabilities because of the lack of understanding. Um, unfortunately, horrible statistics and a bit depressing, I know, but this is this is the you know social model of disability. These are the things it says the problem is not disability itself, but it's the world that disables people. So, more impact of design. As things have been, uh, and you'll start to see it, um, it used to be uh, a system of exclusion. So the lighter blue dots there, the lighter dots in the, in the circle, uh, in the big circle, they represent uh, those who are uh, not disabled or those who do not require any accessibility considerations. And it used to be that, well, you just have to like it or lump it. You either take part in society if you're able to or you don't and that excludes people and then particularly in the games industry it's like well why don't you make games for your kind why don't you make games for disabled people um and that creates separation uh that creates two separate industries really the games industry and then the games industry for disabled people that's, that's still not quite there uh, then we've got integration. So integration is, yes, you can sit at the table, but we've got, it's a bit like Christmas at the family or any other, you know, celebration where the kids are on the little table. They're still at the event, but they're on the little table. Um, we're sort of, we're getting there. But the ideal is inclusion. Including everybody enables you to make um, better, more well-rounded design decisions that don't exclude people uh, and that's the end goal so exclusion and separation it's not not good you're still even even separation is still a form of exclusion integration is kind of where most places are at now and um, it'll be oh yeah we we do have an accessibility team if you want to join that it's like that'd be great but i'm also a games producer the accessibility stuff is stuff i do at the necessity uh the end goal is inclusion um we want everybody to be included uh from the get-go um so how how do we look at accessibility well i i you think of it as using a lens um like when you go to the opticians and they put the magnifiers in and say it's better or worse right so typically when we think of disability, right, and it's okay if this is what your base assumption was, this is normal for many people, is they think of physical disability because that's a disability you can see and it's a disability your brain can sort of go, yeah, I can see how the world would be difficult for them to access if it wasn't made more accessible. But if we uh, look here, this chap, most people would assume that because this chap is using a wheelchair, that he's disabled. In fact, the, the wheelchair itself removes disability. Without the wheelchair, his mobility is low um, or none, because not all wheelchair users are completely unable to walk. Some people are what they call ambulatory wheelchair users. But because there's only stairs in front of him, he is now disabled by his environment. Um, and again, I'm using this example because visually it is easier for you, for nearly everybody to understand uh, when you're given a visual 
and that's someone with invisible disabilities i'm saying like even for me it's easier to um articulate but it's not the wheelchair that makes him disabled which is what the medical model would say um it's actually the fact there's no access to lifts or a ramp that makes him disabled the wheelchair in fact enables him to move around but if we zoom in you can see we've got oh, a, a few more types of disability um obviously we've got things like visual uh, impairments that can be anything from being blind which bl being blind completely blind is relatively rare most people who have vision impairment have some degree of maybe light and dark uh, they can see you know the difference between light and dark but may not be able to detect anything else um all the way through to just you know not having your glasses with you when you need them to see that's that still counts as disability um we've got cognitive disability or neurological so that can range from anything from seizures to having a learning disability um even things like maybe you're stressed um and your brain isn't working quite as well as you would like it to we have hearing or you know audio um impairment so somebody may have a neurological uh, impairment that means that they're hard of hearing like me or they may be somebody who requires either a cochlear implant or a hearing aid uh, important thing to note just because someone has a cochlear implant or a hearing aid does not automatically mean they can hear perfectly um, those people still uh, people with those uh, cochlear implants or hearing aids will still uh, come about with challenges um, and obviously we've got the physical which isn't just wheelchairs it could be limited ranges of motion so limited range of finger motion so holding controllers can be difficult they may not even have you know the ability um uh, people with like arthritis or bone you know joint conditions may have be unable to walk long distances or sit down for long periods of time and the last one is communication impairment so somebody may be non-verbal or may have a stammer or a stutter um or you know in my case they might be they might be scouse and have to do a lot to really overcome that because i would argue that's been more difficult for me than any disability related stuff um but then we can go further in and look at other things that may be you know on the lens do the whole csi zoom in and enhance we've got that's my icon for stress you know the thousand yard stare the someone who's looked into the void and the void looked back um stress can be a quite a severe disability when left untreated uh, and it is you know with with the industry having had a long harrowing history of crunch uh it's an important thing to take into account stress can cause you physical health issues it can cause you uh, cognitive health issues mental health issues um you know a game that is very difficult and doesn't allow any adjustments to that um can you know someone who has got stress may have been able to play that game before but now can't because the stress levels they've already under make the game stressful and not enjoyable um the little child holding the balloon the it star thing um having a child um adults with young children in particular uh are not able to do anything on their own uh small children will follow you into the bathroom they will follow you wherever you go because they model their existence on their parents so if you are a, a parent gamer you may have to have a child on your hip or sat next to you which means you may only be able to use one hand uh, so you may only need, be able to use your mouse or only one side of your controller um uh, being of uh, the polite way to put this is of advancing years so the older you get the more prone your body is to breaking down really um, and as the industry gets older so too do developers and so too do the people who play games and you think about how old people were when they first played um, I can't remember the name but one of the first uh, video games ever made was on an oscilloscope remember what it was called but that was in the 70s right so if you're a kid in the 70s how old are you now 
and are you still playing the games and what kind of challenges does that person now face because of their advancing age pregnancy can be a disability some people are lucky enough to have an uneventful pregnancy of 40 weeks and out comes a child um, but people with pregnancy that can be a disability it can affect mobility it can affect stress levels and, and things like that uh, medications uh, many medications can have side effects and that can cause disability as well some people's medications cause hand tremors some medications cause drowsiness you know things like not being able to stay awake for long periods of time um, which in video games that require you to pay attention for long periods of time uh, that can be a problem but you've also got environmental factors so you've got the environment that you're in are you at home are you at a mate's house are you maybe you've got your laptop at you know uni or in the workplace and you're having a break and you want to play a game um, do you have access to the full environment are there lots of people around that provide distractions um mobile gaming on public transport people do it and they really shouldn't but typically you don't have access to the audio of a game so if you have a game that relies on audio to tell you important information that's not possible to play on uh, public transport hold on there we go um who you're with um the age and the sort of social makeup of the group you're with can affect how you experience the game um and the kind of challenges that come involved with that um some for brightness the brightness of the room uh for example on a day like this if you don't have a monitor that's got anti-glare you're not seeing anything at all you won't see a thing um it also uh, goes for contrast so some games for example assassin's creed valhalla the contrast on that game no matter how much i try and change it i can't see anything i cannot determine the difference between the character and the background because the contrast levels it's not it's not strong enough um whether you're outdoors or not also has a factor again you've got things like sunlight who you're with the environment um how hot your device is getting for example if you are in a nice sheltered cool area of the garden uh, on a day like today um how intensive is the game going to be on the platform chosen in an outdoor environment like on the switch i'm pretty sure my switch would melt if i took it out today and yeah, the temperature so not just temperature depending on what device you're using but also the physical temperature of the person many people's dis uh, disabilities are affected by temperature uh, for example, in my own case, my fibromyalgia is exceptionally affected by temperature. Um, in cold weather, I can't move my hands well, uh, and my knees are absolutely, I want to evict them. Uh, but in the heat, I am more prone to brain fog. My brain just starts to stop working and, and get slow. Um, and so I can't understand things that I used to understand 10 minutes ago when it starts to get anywhere over 25 degrees Celsius. So uh, this image here is from the uh, inclusive micro uh, Microsoft Design Toolkit. Um, and it kind of shows some examples, uh, this diagram of the kinds of disabilities that there could be, and also whether they're permanent, temporary, or situational. Because, uh, not being able to access something can change depending on maybe you've got you know maybe you've broken or sprained your arm that means for the time until your injury is healed you are gaming one-handed um maybe you know uh you've got sick with something you know a cold or flu that's going to affect your ability to sit upright your ability to cognitively process things so when we think of accessibility really what we're thinking of is inclusivity including all kinds of people in thought and design process um, and, and then reducing the amount of barriers to access for all kinds of people um so some examples you've probably seen them in different games in different ways um you've got scalable ui so can you make the ui bigger uh, or smaller that's great for people um who have visual impairments or people like me where i primarily game um, on a desktop pc with a 
I think it's a 36 inch TV attached, something like that. So I game on a TV, so I need I need to be able to see the UI from one and a half, two meters away. Um, actually, yeah, it's more like nearly three meters. Closed captions. You might be thinking, what about subtitles, Harriet? While well, subtitles are great, they are like they are the the level one introduction of of closed captions. Closed captions are like in Half Life and Portal. Um, for example, for those that have watched it, I'm not going to mention anything. For those that haven't, Stranger Things recently was praised quite rightly for really well described closed captioning. Um, what that does is that enables people either with cognitive or um, hearing impairments to be able to understand what's going on from, you know, exactly describing things. Uh, closed captions can be done really well from, I think Portal and Half-Life, the source engine does it by having it come from different directions. Uh, Minecraft does that as well, where it will have a little text line for the sound that's happening from the direction that it's coming from. Um, quick solves and challenge skips. Um, so bear with me, my hand is gone. Uh, so quick solves. If you've got a puzzle and that puzzle is gating content, if that puzzle has uh, is causing a cognitive barrier to a player, they've just spent money on a game they cannot complete. And while yes, it's easy to say, well, you could just Google it, you could just Google the solution. That's assuming that the person is able to do that. So accessing Google, searching the right terms, getting access to a site that's accessible, that contains the information that's accessible. Because watching a YouTube video isn't always accessible. Um, if that person is struggling on a cognitive level, having to troll through 20 videos of, hey, what's up, you guys? It's your guy here to find the right solution, that's not accessibility. So having a way to sort of quickly solve uh, or skip a challenge without it affecting the narrative and enabling full access to the game. Toggling quick time events for people with cognitive issues or mobility issues, um, being able to uh, have maybe just press one button or toggle it entirely, you know, instead of having to button match uh, for example, I can't button mash. Uh, it causes extreme amounts of pain for me, my, thing, my hands and fingers. So anywhere where I can turn that into a single button press. Um, some, play, some, some games will do a press and hold, which still affects me, but it's a little bit easier than a button mash to do a quick time event. And I'm no good with timing either, because cognitively my brain just, by the time my brain's worked out what's happened, I've missed it. And many games with those kinds of quick time events, like, oh, you failed. And then I uninstall the game and ask for a refund. Button control remapping, anywhere you can get that, that is a fantastic thing to do. Um, for people with the Xbox accessible controller, um, having that means that they can assign their switches and their um, add-ons to that to work for them. Um, and it also means for people that have a control setup that's more ergonomic for their needs, they can play the game in a way that's comfortable for them. Uh, difficulty selection. Being able to play a game that's narrative heavy on a story mode, um, or if you prefer that the challenge to play it uh, with more heavy combat, being able to uh, change the difficulty is a big thing, even from the, get uh, the beginning of the game. But if that's also within the game that you can uh, switch the difficulty down or up whenever, uh, that's also good. Because sometimes someone um, might be playing the game. For example, Elden Ring does that with the difficulty um, thing. Um, you can, for a moment, I'm not thinking about Elden Ring. Um, some games will allow you to change the difficulty on the fly, and that means that you can try and see how difficult the game is for you and then change it to something lower. Or even if the game is not challenging enough for you, regardless of any um, access issues, you can change it to be something more challenging. Tool tips, love them very much. Crusader Kings 3, for example, their tool tips are like inception tool tips. Um, all you do is hover over the word that's highlighted, that tells you that it will have a tool tip. 
and then a tooltip appears and then even within that tooltip there may be definitions that you can hover over and get another tooltip and it doesn't disappear immediately it gives you time to read it absolutely love tooltips text to speech this is uh, and conversely speech to text this is more common now in multiplayer games because of uh, an american law called the cvaa i think it is um basically that communication must be accessible to uh, people with disabilities um, so for the division two has it so i turn speech to, uh, text to speech on and speech to text um, because i get easily distracted by the chat window um, and it's pretty simple um, tutorials and by tutorials i mean good nice well-made tutorials um, ones that don't treat the player like uh, they're an idiot but also ones that are able to explain things in a nice uh, friendly way um a game i played recently that that tutorial i thought was really really good was uh, escape academy i think that came out on the game pass yesterday really recommend that tutorial uh, because it's something you play through um and it gives you a chance to see if you can play the game and, and see if those mechanics are something that's enjoyable for you before putting you into the main game uh, and letting you put those things that you've learned in the tutorial into practice. Very good. Visual reinforcement for audio. Um, so that means, for example, if you get shot with a bullet in an FPS game, providing uh, maybe a uh, ping on the screen, blood or, you know, or sort of a, a red vignette around the edge of the screen, that is a visual reinforcement for an audio um, things like uh, some games have that ring where it glows or shows directionality from oh you're being attacked from the side so that's an accessibility thing um, and shape and pattern used alongside color so this helps with people with color blindness um, because not all colors are discernible depending on what kind of color blindness um, it's also good for cognitive accessibility as well uh, because it enables people to see the shapes and the patterns over the color which can be uh, overwhelming on a sensory level although to be fair so can shape and pattern so yeah um so my main thing is i like to talk about what i call accidental accessibility and that is that basically if you design sort of inclusively it leads to game design that isn't necessarily intended to be accessible, but it meets that need for many people. Um, and this is, I use this to explain that people might already be designing accessibly, but they don't know it. Um, so Fallout um, has VATS, that's extremely accessible. Uh, there's many parts of the rest of the game that are not accessible uh, and, and have a lot of access issues, but that specifically um, is accessible for people who have limited mobility or cognitive impairment. They may not be able to aim and get headshots very well. That enables them to get headshots. It enables them to slow down the game enough to sort of comprehend what's going on. That's accessible. Um, this is the menu from Deus Ex Invisible War, so that's Deus Ex 2, so we're looking at early 2000s here. Um, I know a lot of you may be at university, which means you you may not may have been very, very young at the time, but I do recommend you that you play it. It is a really interesting uh, game. Uh, this has accidental accessibility options. So you might notice that it's got subtitles there on the right. Uh, and it also has the ability to change the audio on different channels. So you've got your speech, music and sound effects. Being able to change those enables people that have hearing uh, impairments related to sound levels to customise how that works for them. You've got a difficulty uh, mode on the uh, left there. So you can get easy, normal, hard, expert, I think it is. You can change the opacity of the interface make the interface more minimal so it's less cluttered and not as cognitively overwhelming. You can change the interface colour to help with better contrast. So I change mine to yellow or something like that because it contrasts better with blue. You can have help text so it will tell you things and you can enable auto-aim. You might be thinking, but a PC game with auto-aim, 
seems a bit weird. Well, it's because it was designed for console, um, which meant that they had to enable some aspects that made it work better on console. Uh, it did get a lot of dramatics at the time because it was one of the few games where you could tell it was designed for console, but it has these accessibility options that meant that um, I nearly completed the game because it's got some options that helped me be able to do that. Uh, Creatures 3, another old game. Um, there is a part of the game where you can, it's uh, Creatures 3, for those who don't know, is a, a life sim, a very advanced life sim with uh, creatures called norns, and you basically raise them, you can teach them words, they create multiple generations, you can do heinous experiments, uh, genetic stuff and things like that with them. Uh, but this room is the learning room, and in this, it teaches the norns how to speak when they're babies. Um, it has an animated picture along with text, and then a speech bubble with the text as well. It's showing the word as well as the visual, so a person is able to go, ah, so that's what that word means, or that's the context for that word within the context of the game. Um, an example of uh, the, the machine itself also speaks the word. Um, it's not in English or anything like that. Um, it's sort of like a, a made-up language for the, for the world of the creatures. But uh, what it does is it means that you don't have to be able to hear the word to know that they're being taught that word. Command and Conquer, this is a picture from the remaster, has a speed mode. Uh, you can change the speed. Uh, which for uh, people with cognitive issues, that's fantastic because uh, uh, many of us with uh, cognitive uh, impairments like ADHD do not have the patience um, and it can speed the game up and it enables you to just go through the game uh, and it's got shortcuts for each thing so you can use shortcuts as well. It's not designed to be accessible but it is, it enables people with you know, to go through those things and, and play a game in a way that works for them. Skyrim and many open world games are, by their, na by their nature, accidentally accessible. Um, games that force you into a linear, um, a linear story are great, but for many people with things like children, a heavy job, um, cognitive impairments, being able to drop in and out of a game whenever you want and not have to worry about knowing what you were doing necessarily because the game is open world, that's an accessibility uh, feature, but it's not intended as such, but by their nature. Conversely, some open world games can be inaccessible in that they can feel very overwhelming if there aren't enough directions to sort of guide you. Um, but in terms of the, you know, being able to drop in, drop out and not worry too much about knowing what's going on, that's accessibility. Um, so I'm going to show an Elden Ring. Um, this is an example of, I guess, comparing and contrasting two kinds of different inaccessibilities in a UI, right? So I found Elden Ring's UI quite accessible in that it was minimal, but I generally kind of understood what was going on. Um, it did take me a while. There's a lot of cognitive challenges in that game for me, but it's the first Soulsborne game I've ever enjoyed because I could actually play it and enjoy it. Um, somebody did this, and this is taking the original Assassin's Creed UI and that sort of overstimulation UI. Um, so people were saying, oh, the UI is really bad, you know, I don't understand what's going on. And somebody said with this one, well, it could be worse. Um, to some people, this is great because they could see everything. But to many, many people, this is not accessible. This is a lot of information. My, my brain cannot figure out which bit am I, what am I looking at? Where am I going? I don't, there's not enough screen space in the middle for me to determine my direction or my destination. Um, and obviously in many of these games you can turn them off, but it's an example of how you, you can go too far with these things. Um, so my next one 
there's a bit of a where and when. So where do you put in accessibility options? You know, uh, you can do it in your pre-production. That is the best time to do accessibility considerations and think about these things before you've even started making the game. Um, when you're designing and prototyping, put the lens on and be like, is this, uh, you know, is this better or worse for uh, accessibility? Is this uh, going to be accessible? What have we already got that might already be accessible? Uh, in pre-production, you can research accessibility elements. Look to it. If there's accessibility options you want to implement, you can look at how other games have done it and do some research at that point. And you could probably also inform, uh, formulate your own in, internal accessibility framework, either for yourself or if you're working for someone uh, in a team. Uh, you can formulate, a, you know, a method for implementing accessibility at different stages. So in production, you can iterate on your features. OK, this feature is fantastic. The subtitles are great, but can we make it into closed captioning? Is that possible in production? Um, testing your features with QA um, and including uh, in QA and playtest, including. Uh, um, so, yeah, there are different areas that you can look at. Um, like the Outer Worlds, they patch their game after release to include uh, scalable fonts. Um, I think there's a talk they did where they uh, they did a post mortem about it and said they didn't think uh, that they could do that with the fonts. And admitted they admitted that they could have just spent a bit of time researching was that a possibility, because none of them thought that people would be playing the game at uh, at distance. They were so used to how it was in the game when they were developing it. Um, but they did patch it and, and fix that after release. Um, so some examples of questions um, to to use as lenses to filter through is, you know, does making this more accessible fundamentally change the game? Does it affect the story? Does it affect the actual gameplay? Um, most the most most often the answer to this is no. Most accessibility transitions will not affect the game. They won't change the game at all. Uh, for example, Fortnite has the ability you can turn off sound um, because having sound is not a fundamental part of the game in order to be able to enjoy the game. Uh, will it cost me more time, money or energy to think about this later on? It was more costly um, for the guys for the outer worlds to actually implement a patch afterwards because when you do production, you budget for the time of production. Um, so they had to pay people to fix this afterwards. Um, so maybe that thinking about this as early as possible will save you money in the long run and time in the long run. Um, have we already got features that are accessible by accident? So what have we already got that works? Uh, has it already been done? This feature already been done accessibly before? So if you've got a feature and you're like, actually, I remember seeing this in this game. They've already done that. Use that research, implement it. Can we make this an optional feature? So maybe a feature by its nature is not very uh, accessible. Um, is there a way to make it optional so that someone can turn it off or on? For example, screen shape. Uh, screen shape can be optional. It's not a necessity. Um, it does add to game feel for people, you know, for certain games, but it might cause seizures or nausea. Um, uh, which obviously you don't want people to have that so association with your game. Um, have we tested this feature? Uh, if so, what did we find out about that feature that's relevant to accessibility? So as you're testing and iterating, you should be making notes on what you learned from it, what went right, what went wrong, and looking at that through the lens of accessibility. But OK, this worked really well, but on an accessibility level, that's going to mean that we are actually just a seventh of you, you know, one out of seven people that are playing our game won't ever be able to play it if we implement it like this. So keep making those notes. The the bigger your library of information you have in your head about, you know, your designs and whether it's accessible, the better. And who would be enabled to access the game if we implement this feature as as it is currently? Look at the actual real uh, people cost of, you know, who is not going to be to play the game so you know if we make this game audio focused and make it so we don't have audio we, we have all these features that rely on audio for you to understand what's going on 
uh, by not adding in visual cues for that audio, that means all people with hearing impairments will not be able to play the game. So I've got a few links here uh, for like the how. Um, like I said, I will share the slides so that you can click through to these uh, links. Um, the game accessibility guidelines, um, that one's a good one. It's an Excel spreadsheet, so you can literally go through and be like, okay, yeah, I can implement that, or I can do that, or I can do that. Um, accessible player experiences is another way of looking at accessibility. It gives you a little sort of prompt uh, and has visual information to help you connect the dots with how this is going, how it's going to affect people. Uh, Xbox accessibility guidelines, uh, it is looking like in order to be able to publish on Xbox, there are going to need to be a bare minimum of accessibility considerations. Um, so those guidelines are really good, good thing to have on hand. Um, Shell games, um, they, have, they set up their own accessibility matrix. So I put that as an example of how you can develop your own accessibility framework. Um, there's also some accessibility guidelines for VR games where uh, a group of people studied all the different ways of making games accessible and how they related to VR. So if you're interested in VR games and making them accessible, there's some stuff there. And Microsoft Inclusive Design. So everything at Microsoft is filtered through uh, inclusive design. Um, and yeah, it's really, really good stuff. Uh, and there's a quote here from uh, Vivek Gohill, um, uh, and he says, accessibility does not damage gaming, it fixes gaming. Um, I worked with Vivek, uh, he was in that uh, trailer for the scope thing earlier. Um, it's true, it doesn't, it doesn't break anything, it doesn't damage or undermine gaming. We've accidentally been doing accessibility for decades uh, and no one realised. Uh, but the more accessibility you do, it makes it easier for everybody to have the ability to play your games. Um, so that is my wall of text uh, verbal uh, spiel at you. Um, I'm always contactable. You can send messages on, on Discord. That's absolutely fine. Also on uh, Twitter, you can also send emails with questions as well. Uh, and if you have any questions now, feel free to ask them.